absolutely not. Um, uh, she's working for. Is it? No, I'm sorry, it's Nicole Rycroft. Sorry, sorry. Oh, Nicole. Oh, Nicole. Nicole. Right, she worked for the Canopy Project. Yeah, she's, yeah, she's in the building. Is but she here? She, yeah, she's here as we speak. Um, she's seeing Andy Tate. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, but maybe you could see her later. Yeah, um, I do know. That. Yeah. She's in London for the next day or two, so oh, okay. we'll catch up with her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, but you're away. We're away. Okay. Okay. Thank, okay, you. thank you. Okay. Um, so, John, thank you so much for agreeing to an interview. Pleasure. Um, as you may know, I'm writing this book. It's mm -hmm. called A Restor Restored Earth: Ten Paths to a Hopeful Future. Right. And I'm publishing it with the the crowdfunding publisher Unbound. Right. And as part of the writing, I'm interviewing some of my great heroes and some of the people in our environmental world who've right. done so much and very kindly you've agreed to be one of those, the first okay. in fact. Um, so I've got a number of questions to ask you, mm -hmm. um, but I thought I'd start by asking for how long you've worked at Greenpeace and how, uh, and how long you've been director and how it all began for um, you. Well, I, I, I've worked at Greenpeace for a very long time. So I, I joined Greenpeace in 1991 um, and I've done just about every job there is to <laughs> do here. Um, like most people who joined Greenpeace, you know, several decades ago, there, is, there wasn't the same specialism that you have now, and you could kind of fairly freely move around. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas now with the digital age, you know, you've got to be a millennial in order to work <laughs> in the mobilization department, for right. example, because yes. the technology and so on has... Um, <laughs> moved on so fast. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it would be too difficult for us to, for that to come naturally to us. Um, whereas I suppose, you know, when I started here, computers were just coming in, the mobile yeah. phone didn't exist and so on and so forth. So yeah. so we did, uh, and, and it was a smaller organization. Um, and so you did tend to do more than one job, yeah. uh, which of course was great and very exciting. And it, it's not true people can move around today, but I think, I think in those yeah. days it, it, people did, generally you could be uh, an environmentalist with whatever background or skills you had and more or less do anything. It was um, it was pretty open in those days. And you've, you've been director of this place for how long now? Well, I became executive director, um, well, no, I don't know, probably mm -hmm. around 87, 87 no, yeah. about, sorry, 2008, 2009, okay. something, okay. about 2008 okay. I became executive okay. director. Good, good run. Yeah. And I hear you have a desk right in there in the thick of things, and uh, it's still a team effort, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah. look, it's a, this is a very open plan office, and mm. and although we have a sort of hierarchical management structure, um, because we need it for health and safety reasons and for legal reasons, mm. um, actually nobody takes any notice of that. So yeah. we uh, <laughs> <laughs> free place. Yes. Wonderful. Like, uh, yes, I queue up for lunch like everybody else. Right, and, that's, uh, that's people good. challenge me like they challenge anybody else, so, right. as it should be. That's fantastic, John. Yeah. Uh, well, my main questions for you really are concerning the campaigns that you're involved in now, and also the ones that you've you've run in the part in the past. Um, and also, I think uh, to ask you for a sense of you know how how you envisage the world that we are tr mm. seeking to create effectively in the years ahead, and how we're going to get there and um, you know, what's really required to build on the, the amazing year last year that we had with the mm. Paris Agreement mm. and the SDGs um, and, and really to get a sense from you about how the campaign is going. I mean, there's so many good efforts around the world to basically change the world, but I wonder from you how, you, how you're feeling about how it's going. So I suppose my first question is, could you describe to me the kind of world you envisage in 2015? Mm. You know, when, when you think about it, what do you see? Yeah, I mean, look, th th these are big questions. Yeah. Um, many books have been written about them. <laughs> uh, so to say, to say it succinctly, look, I, I mean, I think that we face probably the two biggest issues that we face are climate change and, and biodiversity loss, mm. and they are interlinked. And I would say that if you, if you really honed it down to just make it more digestible, I would say that the burning of fossil fuels and particularly the burning of coal are the biggest cause of climate change and needs to be stopped. And first and foremost, we have to stop burning coal. Yeah. And I think the second really big issue is, is uh, biodiversity loss on land um, and at sea. And I would say that on land, the biggest issue probably in terms of a, a, dis a, a driver of, of uh, ecosystem destruction is probably uh, around livestock. Mm -hmm. e either mm -hmm. in terms of um, the animal feed, the amount of land you need for animal feed, mm -hmm. soya and so on, 
or just the amount of land taken up by grazing. Mm -hmm. So I suppose if you ask me then, okay, can we solve the two biggest problems that the world faces, which is climate change and biodiversity loss, being driven by fossil fuels and meat consumption, my reply will be pretty easily. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, because in fact, you know, renewable technologies and everything that goes with it in terms of um, you know, storage, energy efficiency and so on and so forth are now pretty much on par with fossil fuels mm -hmm. uh, and dropping in price the whole time. So that doesn't take a genius to work out. We could solve that problem and we could solve it in the time frame that's, uh, that's required. I think when it comes to, uh, say, meat, if you, if you want to solve the problems, of, and it's not just meat, but if, if I look at what is driving um, the destruction, say, of rainforests, but other ecosystems, most of it is around, broadly around the issue of, of, of meat, but there are some other, uh, other drivers of, as, as well, like, say, palm oil or pulp and paper. But again, I would say we can, we can have an extremely healthy diet, mm -hmm. live very, very well mm -hmm. without such high levels of meat consumption. And in fact, if you look at the levels of meat consumption that happen today in, in, in Europe, the United States, China, they're actually at, at very unhealthy levels. They're having huge health impacts as well as environmental impacts. So, you know, mm -hmm. both of these, you know, if, if I was saying, you know, all these problems are too overwhelming, we can't possibly solve them, the, world's, mm. the world is going to hell on our, on our heart. And I just think, well, come on guys, what's, what are the issues? Yes. <laughs> what are the solutions? Are, are they doable or not? And to me, they're eminently doable. Fantastic, thank you, John. I'll come back to oceans later, but if we could look, look a bit further in depth into the, the coal issue, therefore. Um, we're all familiar now with this concept of stranded assets and Mark Carney, the Governor of Bank mm -hmm. of England, has been giving very good speeches highlighting the issue of tragedy of horizons and drawing attention to mm -hmm. the issue. But we also know that in China there are coal power stations being built effectively still every week mm -hmm. and in India there's also a lot of planned mm -hmm. coal expansion. How do we make the argument powerfully in the next phase that really we simply can't continue with coal over the short term if we're going to have any hope of meeting our climate goal and, and how, do the pol how does the politics of that campaign play out in both in China and India but also in countries like the US where it's become a real mm. issue in the general election, the mm. forthcoming election. Mm. Yeah, I mean look, the, 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 you know, and, that, and that's the problem isn't it, I mean the, the, the issue around uh, climate change and, and around burning coal is a political issue. Mm. It's not an economic issue. Mm. It's, it's not a, a technical issue. It's, it's a political issue. You know, if, if governments today decided they wanted to transition out of coal, mm. they could very easily do so. Mm. Yeah. Now, whether they can ease so easily transition out of coal into renewables or whether they will transition to a, a mixture of less carbon intensive fossil fuels and renewables in, 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 a, in a, you know, over, over a phase kind of transition to renewables is open to debate depending on, mm -hmm. you know, where the country is and the, the, the money that they have available and resources and mm -hmm. so on. But if you take a country like, say, say, China or even India for that matter, and certainly the United States, it is as cheap for them to go down mm -hmm. a renewable energy route as it is to go down a fossil fuel route. Yeah. And that's without taking into account the externalities of, of climate change, air pollution, and all of the consequences in terms of, of, of coal mining. Mm -hmm. So I think then you have to ask yourself, okay, why does China still build one coal-fired power station a week on average or mm -hmm. whatever it is? Mm -hmm. is, is I think that there is a, there's a certain inertia in the system. Mm -hmm. There's, there's a lot of coal miners employed uh, in the mines. I don't know, probably around a million, million mm. and a half coal miners. Mm. Quite a big social issue for China to have to uh, deal with in terms of how do you develop a just, just transition. Mm. And then I think that there is also a massive waste of uh, investment because actually what you see happening in China is they're building these coal-fired power stations a lot of them are only being run at five to ten percent capacity mm. because regional governments are meeting growth targets and so they're investing in right. this infrastructure without actually using this infrastructure mm. uh, so that they can then report back to the central committee 
oh look, we're right. growing and developing, yeah. we're meeting our targets. Of course, it, this is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem when you've got a, a, a centralized system like you have in, in, in China because mm -hmm. there isn't the same market forces, there aren't the same kind of checks and balances. Mm -hmm. So you get these huge distortions. But then on the other hand, when you look at China, it's also number one in wind. Mm -hmm. It's number one in solar. It's number one in, in battery energy storage. Yes. It will be number one in um, you know, EV and electric vehicles. Yeah. So, and you know, because of China, the, the, the cost of solar panels has dropped you know, dramatically, mm -hmm. whatever it is, 70% yeah. in the last five or 10 years. Yeah. You know, so, you know, so China has made an enormous contribution to the world yes. in terms of bringing down the cost of renewables which means you can now roll it out more or less on par with fossil fuels, but they still have a huge inertia uh, in their you. system. Very clear. And some, like Dieter Helm, would say that natural gas will have to play a role in the transition. Others say we can make a transition entirely through renewables such as solar and, and wind. I assume you're in the latter camp, but um, do you have a view on, on natural gas and also on nuclear, which others see in the scenarios? Well, look. I mean, the, the the thing is, again, this is this is a a kind of a political decision, isn't mm. it? Because mm. the, the the thing is, if you if you look at a a low or zero carbon energy system, you can have renewable energy, you can have fossil fuels, including gas, say, mm. capturing the carbon, and you can have nuclear power. Mm. Now, all of those are technologies that will answer the problem of climate change, mm. because all of them either don't have CO2 emissions or capture the CO2 mm. emissions. So then it comes down to personal preference, mm. Mm. <laughs> political ideology, yeah. cost, yeah. you know, and various other things. Now, I think that we would make the argument that if you were, say, looking at, say, the UK, that we've got an enormous renewable resource mm. in terms of uh, offshore and onshore wind mm. and in solar, marine technologies like tidal and so on and so forth there's also now i think since there's been such a massive drop in battery storage we can now deal with a lot of the problems of intermittency mm -hmm. we can also create a european grid around renewable energy through interconnectors and so on mm -hmm. we could even go to iceland get geothermal power mm -hmm. and we could have a massive um you know I I infrastructure program around energy efficiency mm -hmm. you know and to yes. really um, reduce our, our demand for energy and of course you can have smart grids you know the, one of the problems with any energy system is that um, in the rush hour in the morning and the rush hour in the evening you need mm -hmm. you need twice as much power as you need for the mm -hmm. rest of the day and, and uh, 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 an awful lot more than what you need at night yeah. Yeah. so the thing is is that if you can actually for that hour in the morning or that hour in the evening you can switch lots of things off you don't need mm -hmm. in order to switch on what you do need mm. or you can have interconnectors where you're going through different time zones so the rush hour in say France or, or, or in the near continent is, is one hour different to hours mm -hmm. if you go further it's two hours difference mm -hmm. so, so you can balance these things out just by thinking about energy yes. in, a, in a smarter way and I think that if you, if you have a mixture of these things then I don't think you need these huge nuclear power stations, um, which to my mind are sort of 50s technology, mm -hmm. very expensive, huge waste problems, mm. proven not to work very well in terms of the developments that we've currently seen with say EDF yes. in, in Finland and in France. And so I, I kind of think the world has, has now changed dramatically today to what it was say five or ten years ago when these uh, decisions were being made about yes. Hinckley and they have this government for political reasons has decided not to take that into account because th they don't want to offend the French and the Chinese mm. and particularly with Brexit so I think if you take each country you'll see different things happening you know because of the politics or the economics or whatever mm -hmm. But I think overall, are we moving towards a renewable energy world? Undoubtedly, yes. yes. Because the price is dropping. And ultimately, if you're a capitalist, you want to make money. Mm. You will, you will, you know, it's like water flows downhill. You will gravitate to what is ever the, the cheapest, most efficient, easy way to get energy, if that's what, that what you need. And, and renewables are increasingly the place to go. The place to go. I suppose the challenge is this race against time and there's this new handsome paper which suggests that there's enough oil and gas and 
coal commitments in the system, which to already take us over the, the 1.5, yep. 2 degree uh, world that we've committed to in Paris. And therefore, there's almost a kind of onus on us to not to take forward any of these new investments, and yet they're, they're in the system. So how do we make this transition to so fast? Well, the, you know, I mean, the thing is, <laughs> I mean, it's not just Hanson. I mean, everybody yeah, is saying everyone, that, yeah. that, that what is in known reserves of oil, coal and gas cannot be burned to stay within yeah. two degrees. And that, is, that is impossible. So the idea that today we are still hunting for new fossil fuel reserves, you know, that BP and Shell and all these companies are doing every day, spending, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars mm -hmm. hunting for new fossil fuel reserves is insane yeah. because you cannot burn what you've already got. So I think, first of all, if you imagine switching all of that money into renewables and efficiency and reducing the demand for energy, then that would be a, a very logical yeah. um, thing to do. And maybe we are reaching that point now where oil companies, fossil fuel companies are beginning to realize mm -hmm. that actually what they're doing doesn't make sense, or at least mm -hmm. their investors are beginning to realize that what they're doing actually doesn't make sense. But I think that beyond that, in terms of what Hanson's saying, is in terms of the, the s we need to speed this up. Mm -hmm. So then I think the onus then is, is to really speed up what is going to be the quickest and fastest way of uh, bringing clean energy onto the system. Mm -hmm. Now again, we would say it's much quicker to do renewable energy, yeah. it's much quicker to do energy efficiency, mm -hmm. it's, it's much better socially in terms of, uh, of, of the jobs and, and, and so on and so, mm -hmm. so forth that it would bring with it. Mm -hmm. So I think there's also a kind of an opportunity cost. If you decide to spend 18 billion pounds on Hinkley that may mm -hmm. never work, well that's, that could be a lot of money that you've, you've, you've just wasted and if you put that into renewable technologies, you could do it much quicker and have much more power. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose that would be our argument why you would choose one rather than the other, even if we agree they're both zero carbon power. Great. Thank you, John. And in the context of Shell, therefore, and their hoped for explorations in the Arctic, which you campaigned on mm. over recent years, Shell then pulled back or pulled out mm. as it were and I wanted to ask you a bit more about that campaign and also about the Arctic mm. because it's such an important mm. place and there's so much to play for there. Mm. Look I mean you know you're right the Arctic is a is an extraordinary beautiful place and it's disappearing mm. and the consequences of it are, are disappearing are kind of quite profound because mm you know, they, they call the Arctic the Earth's air conditioner. Mm. You know, it helps cool the planet because it reflects light off the, off the white ice, mm. bounces back out mm. into space, and, and therefore it helps it cool. So when it, when it goes, you know, the heat will get absorbed by the sea, and that will, that will warm up the planet. Mm. And in warming up um, um, the seas around the Arctic, you'll then increase the melt that's happening on land in, in, in Greenland because the seas around the coast will be warmer mm. and you get bigger glacial melt and then you have more sea level rise and so on and so forth. So, and you also have impact on, you know, iconic species like polar bears mm. and Inuit communities and so on and so mm. forth. So, you know, the Arctic in a way was, a it was a bit like, the, you know, canary in the coal mine, you know, mm. here was uh, a hostile environment that people had written off as a wasteland mm, mm. because it was so terrifying to go there to do anything, mm. fishing, oil, mineral extraction. And now because of climate change, it's now, you know, the oil industry is now thinking, oh, we can go up there and explore for oil. The fishing industry is thinking, oh, we can take our industrial trawlers up mm, there. Mm. You know, the tourist interest industry is now thinking, oh, we can take our cruise ships up there. You know, now, now everybody is moving into an area that was utterly hostile yes and nobody could go there. Yeah. Now that's an extraordinary change that's mm. happened in a very short space of time. Yeah. But what is extraordinary about it is that Shell will see the Arctic melting because of the burning of fossil fuels causing climate change. And we use that opportunity to go to the Arctic to drill for more fossil fuels, mm. which will cause more climate change, which will cause yes. the Arctic to melt faster. Mm. Now, in, 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 in any other kind of area, you know, you probably get sectioned for that mm. sort of behaviour, <laughs> <laughs> or locked up, mm. Mm. because you know it's it, mm. it it's it's a form of madness. Mm. Mm. Um, but to me, it's also like criminally reckless uh, what they're doing, and there's no sanction against them. Mm. 
Mm. In fact, what they're doing is perfectly legal. Mm. And that's what I sort of find kind of quite extraordinary. Mm. Because instead, Shell could be using all that knowledge and, and skill and money that they have available. Mm. They could be drawing down their, their oil reserves to a certain point while we transition mm. and using that money to invest in a, in a green energy future. Mm -hmm. And you know, and if, if all these companies did that, they would yes. have a future, yeah. we would have a future. And you know, we, could, we could live on a habitable planet. And, and I think that this is, you know, it's possible, mm, but it would require uh, government action for this to happen, and it would also inquire, it would also require investor action mm, for this to happen. Mm. So I wanted to ask you about that, but in terms of government action, we now have a Paris Agreement, mm. which was a remarkable diplomatic mm. achievement. And one would have thought, therefore, that governments ought to be holding the majors to account, in a sense, mm. in light of Paris and saying that their plans have to become consistent with the trajectory on which all governments have agreed as of December mm. last year. But is there enough, is there evidence at this point that the majors are completely recalibrating their plans in light of the Paris Agreement, or are they effectively pursuing business as usual? No, they're pursuing business as usual. I mean, yeah. look, you know, you see BP at the moment mm. trying to get into the Australian bite. Mm. You know, mm. this, is, this is an extraordinary, you know, pristine marine environment on the south and west coast of Australia. Mm. You know, important breeding ground for the southern right whale. Mm. You know, iconic species that are found nowhere else on the planet except in this area. Mm. But also a very hostile environment. Mm. And, you know, between Australia and, and the Antarctic. And they think this is a great place mm. to go and explore for new oil mm. that we can't possibly burn if we're going to prevent climate change mm. from happening. So this is this is this this is madness. I mean, mm. but so I don't think that BP or these oil companies have learned any lesson from Paris. Mm. They haven't changed anything as a result of Paris. I mean, the only thing that they might have changed as a, is 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 the fall is a result of the fall in the price of oil, mm. not not because of Paris. And I think mm. that that's because they, and to a certain extent, investors still don't think that the governments, having signed that piece of paper in Paris mm. are going to act on it. Mm. Mm. And I think that's where we have to hold governments to account because now they're going through the process of ratifying the Paris mm. Agreement. And so we've now got to say, okay, now you've ratified mm. it. You've now got to deliver on it. Mm. And in that, the role of a Greenpeace in every nation where it works is critical because it informs citizens and citizens yeah. campaign to hold their governments Absolutely. to account. Absolutely. Yeah. How many Greenpeaces are there in the world, or how, how many members of Greenpeace <laughs> are there in the world? Well, not enough. Not I mean, enough. Uh, you, okay. you know, I mean, the thing is, Greenpeace has got, I don't, I don't know, it's two or three million members around the world. Yeah. You know, we operate in, you know, a few dozen countries. But mm. but the thing is, is that, and, it, and it's not just Greenpeace anyway, I mean, you mm. need you need thousands of organisations, mm. and, and it's not just NGOs. You, you've got to have governments, you've got to have progressive companies, mm -hmm. you've got to have many civil society actors and, and, mm -hmm. and institutions, large and small, all uh, moving in the same direction mm -hmm. in terms of saying that not only have we got to meet the, the goals of the uh, Sustainable Development Commission that mm -hmm. were also signed off mm -hmm. um, the last year, but we've also got to meet the goals of the, of the, of the Paris Climate mm -hmm. Agreement. And, and that is going to require a, quite a powerful force because you're up against some of the most powerful companies in the world and some quite entrenched petro states mm. um, who aren't going to give up without a fight. Yes, and some of the petro, some of the biggest oil companies are effectively nationally owned, yes. which is another yes. difficulty. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of the, the citizens of the world and the institutions that you're describing, I mean, a global movement, 2015 felt like quite a, a big year for that because well, really from 2014 onwards there were huge marches globally calling for climate action there was a lot of mobilisation around the time of the UN SDGs mm. being signed in September. Uh, and then in Paris, I think there were lots of such um, peaceful demonstrations planned, but then of course there was the terrorist incident and mm. the moment before the Paris Agreement began the negotiations. But is it your feeling that we have a sort of global movement now like we've never done before, or have there been other periods in the last 30 years or so in which you've been involved where there's been a a greater level of global sort of consciousness about our environment and the need to act. 
I think there have been bigger global movements on other issues. Mm -hmm. um, and I still don't think we're as big or as powerful as we need to be as, a, as an environmental movement. So if you, say, look at the movement that sprung up against the Iraq war, mm. for example, I think it was, you know, yes, we had a m yes. millions of people mm. on the streets in this country. Mm. Um, I've never seen anything uh, anywhere near that in terms of a, a climate march, mm. Um, mm. for example. And I think if you look at, say, many other movements that have happened, okay, they may, may be in individual countries like, like say, the civil rights movement in, in, in the March on Washington, mm -hmm. say, in the United States yeah. or something, is that we haven't seen that kind of movement connected to the environment. Mm -hmm. It has been more, more dispersed. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not to say that it isn't more powerful in other ways, and, and maybe it doesn't need to be um, in such a big kind of collective form and maybe it never will be. Mm. Uh, maybe we live in a digital age, maybe mm. people connect in different ways mm. and so on and so forth, not necessarily in terms of a, a manifestation on the streets. But if you see, for example, the campaign against the pipeline, the tar sands pipeline mm. in the United States, mm. it was stopped. And mm. it, that was stopped by mass protests. Yeah. A mass movement blocked that pipeline. Mm. If you look at the tar sands pipelines that they're wanting to build out to the west coast of Canada. Mm. You see indigenous people at the forefront of, of blocking those mm. pipelines coming out of the um, tar sands because their communities are particularly impacted mm. um, by the toxic pollution from mm. tar sands. So I think when you look around the world and you look at the individual protests that are going on, even mm. in China, mm. you look at the protests around air pollution yes. connected with the burning of coal, this has forced the government to act. Yes. And this isn't a democracy. This is a quite an authoritarian one party state. Yes. But there have been tens of thousands of protests yes. around this issue that the government has been forced to respond to. So I suppose if you add up mm. all those mm. actions that are happening all mm. around the world yes. every day, yes. north, south, east and west, that does a, amount to a phenomenal yes. number of people. Yes. But it's not it's not like seen in one place or one no. time in the same way that say some of the movements historically have been yes but perhaps all all the more powerful for that or i think way. in some ways more powerful and more yeah. targeted and more and local more targeted. bottom up exactly yes i wanted to go back then to having done talked about energy to go back to your point about livestock which i think is very powerful and i'm sure you're right that, the, that what's driving primarily deforestation in certainly in south america is um livestock and then in Southeast Asia it has been to a significant degree palm oil but mm -hmm. I, and also in, in Sub-Saharan Africa perhaps a, a variety of forces, uh, logging and um, cocoa and, mm. and other commodities but I think you're entirely right to focus on livestock. Um, it's about 75% yeah. of land, uh, of agricultural land globally right. is used either for grazing animals or feeding animals. Yes. Right, right. So nearly all yeah. of our land yeah. is one way or another connected to meat. Yes, and all of the soil that's causing deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon or elsewhere in the Amazon region, m the vast majority of that soil is effectively for, for chicken and for pigs, pigs, and, pigs and, yeah. and so on. But it's not just in the Amazon, it's going into the Cerrado, yes. going into Argentina, Peru, you know, yes. you, you know. Paraguay, Uruguay, yeah. etc. Yes. So how does a campaign on this look? Does it focus on the companies? Does it focus on the farmers? Does it focus on diet? Uh, how do you see this one going? Well, I mean, I d that, that mm. needs to be kind of thought through. Mm. But my, my sense about this is, is that actually companies, I mean, you should always, you should always tackle power. Yes. And, and so my feeling is, is that we, we should really tackle the, the big meat producers mm. and the retailers selling the meat. Mm. And in an ideal world, what you would do is you would say if you want to eat meat mm. it has to be fed locally mm -hmm. ideally it would be fed you know summer out on the grass mm. winter silage mm. but if you were going to feed it with crops those crops should be grown mm. locally mm. because i think what's happening at the moment is we're importing mm. The, the you know the deforestation or the ecosystem damage mm. through the ingredients mm. which are going into say feeding our animals mm. so when you you know you eat a chicken or a pig mm. you can you can say oh well you know 
this was the chicken or the pig was local. Yes. I mean, not necessarily organic, but it was local. Yeah, yeah. But but the damage is is mainly yes. done mm. by what are you feeding that pig or mm. chicken? Mm. Might even have been a free range one, but that doesn't mean that it wasn't no. eating. Yeah. Yeah. So Soy so grams. exactly. Mm. So so my sense is is that actually. It, we should change our agricultural system dramatically mm. anyway, anyway yeah. um, but but my my feeling is is that actually when it comes to meat we should eat less of it mm. it should be better quality mm. and we should take a hundred percent responsibility for mm. it mm. and I think that that should apply globally so mm. basically what you're doing is, is that you're freeing up the land to either be restored mm. Um, mm. because basically we should really be thinking mm. about how we can put the carbon mm. back, how we can protect the uh, biodiversity. Mm. And I think, you know, in order to do that, we've got to take our boots yes. off mm. the land, which is doing so much damage mm. in the South. It's a very powerful vision. And, and, and I think the arguments that you also raised about health will be fundamental there. The fact that cancer rates and obesity yeah. and so on are so, so much in the ascendancy yeah. throughout the yeah. develop, developing world alike could be power, that could be a powerful ally to the argument. Your two big challenges, climate change and biodiversity loss, uh, you do, do, divided biodiversity loss into land and seas. Mm. And I wondered therefore whether we could turn our attention a bit to the ocean mm. and to the marine environment recognizing that Greenpeace has done a lot of mm. work in this area. The issues here are formidable too, plastics, pollution, mm. ocean acidification, mm. overfishing and the like. And I wondered whether you could talk a little bit about what Greenpeace is doing to address those loss in, in the ocean yeah. as well. Okay, well look, I mean I mean first of all those those are three very different things. So I mean to yes. to, to tackle ocean acidification we basically have to stop Just burning coal yeah. <laughs> and, and fossil fuels which is causing yeah. the ocean acidification yeah. so I suppose you know the, when you solve the problem of climate change you solve the problem of ocean acidification mm -hmm. and, and that is actually a very and should be maybe a more high profile yes. driver of why we need to yes. tackle the issue of burning fossil fuels. Yeah. I think that the issue around ocean plastics mm -hmm. is also kind of very interesting thing because basically this is tackling the economy because mm. you know at the moment we have a very sort of one-way linear, linear linear economy mm. and basically what we're saying for example with with plastics is that we should move to a circular economy mm. we should not have a throwaway disposable economy mm. we should not have single use of say plastic you know you, you buy a bottle of water you drink the water mm. and you chuck the, the plastic mm. away oh, yeah. is, is that that kind of economy we should move away from mm. and I think that if we move to a circular economy you, look my my vision you asked me what my vision mm. for 2050 Please, would yeah. be <laughs> my vision for 2050 mm. would be energy from renewable sources yeah. and a circular economy yeah yeah and and I think that dealing with ocean plastics is a very good way into the circular economy because I think if we can start getting major companies you, I mean look if you take the plastic bottles all mm. the big companies are involved in that mm. Nestle uh, Danone mm. Pepsi Coca-Cola mm. I mean these are some of the world's biggest most high profile companies mm. are all involved in this throwaway stuff mm. so I kind of think if we tackled them and we got them to change mm. their production systems mm. we got the waste industry to change mm. in terms of it was into recycling raw materials mm. producing new products and so on and so forth mm. that we could then begin really to have a huge impact mm. and this would be great great for employment yes um yeah you know it'd be great in terms of uh you know having a more sustainable economy mm. uh and in terms of our more sustainable use of natural resources and mm. so on and so forth mm. so this i think is the is the second issue. the third issue to connect to oceans is 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 really connected to overfishing yeah you know we need more marine reserves mm. now we've had some great progress in terms of some governments have announced them mm. including the uk government has announced yeah. some very big uh, marine reserves around overseas territories for mm. example the united states and others have done similar things mm. but we need to go much much further and much faster on that but we also need a, a sustainable um, fishing industry we need mm. to protect coastal communities we need to protect small-scale um, fishermen mm. and we've got to end this highly destructive uh, industrial fishing industry mm. Mm. very clear thank you John 
so Greenpeace is doing some campaigning on this at the moment in the UK. On context. all three areas. All three areas. On all three areas. Well, yeah. ocean acidification mm. in relation to work on climate change, change but in yeah. terms of, we do a lot of work on ocean plastic. We've run a huge campaign this year on, on microbeads, for example, mm. to get the UK government to ban microbeads. Mm. Mm. We've had considerable success. Uh, we only launched a campaign in January, and we've always already had big moves by the government on that. And we will go much further now and, and really tackle the bigger issue about ocean plastics, mm -hmm. and particularly what the big corporations are up to. Very good. Thank you, John. I wanted to ask you about a campaign that you're particularly proud of. And um, I noted last week the Duke of Cambridge, Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, mm. went to the Great Bear Rainforest in mm. Canada. And I believe that you were very involved mm. way back when in, in that campaign. Mm. And I wanted to ask you a bit about that and, and how you won, what you achieved, how you, we won, and what lessons we might learn from a mm. campaign of that kind, which was successful. Yeah. I mean, the, look, that campaign was, I, I got involved in that campaign in 1995. Mm. And it was actually the first forest campaign um, that I got um, involved in as part of uh, Greenpeace here in the UK. Mm. And it, it was interesting in the sense that, one, it was a rainforest, mm. but it was a temperate rainforest mm. in the north rather mm. than the south. Mm. And people had some difficulty in understanding that there were rainforests in the north mm. as well as the south, because people mm. just think of tropical rainforests, mm. not temperate rainforests. Mm. Mm. And also temperate rainforests are actually quite rare. Mm. You know, you may, mainly find them along, on, along the coast of major oceans, but mm. a lot of them are being cleared out. And, and if you say take the UK, mm. we used to have temperate rainforests, you know, on the west coast of Scotland yes. and so on, but all right. of them have gone. They've gone, yeah. Um, either the, by the Romans or mm. Henry VIII or a mixture <laughs> of the two. They went a long time ago. Yes. But of course, the ones in, in, in Canada were, were bigger. Mm. Um, Canada, the land area was bigger, the population was smaller. Mm. So as far as the logging companies were concerned, they thought this was <clears throat> a resource where you never get to the horizon. Mm. You know, they, they just clear cut <clears throat> year after year, yeah. going up the coast, thinking this goes on forever. Yeah. And of course, when we got involved in this campaign, actually, you could see the horizon. There was something like 69 intact valleys left mm. out of hundreds. Mm. Mm. And, and when we launched that campaign internationally, and this was really the light bulb moment. And I remember being at a meeting on Bowen Island, mm. um, um, it, just off the, the uh, coast from, from Vancouver, where mm. we, we met as a, a kind of forest team, mm. uh, had a meeting on Bowen Island. And the thing is, is that the local people have been protesting against this clear cutting, but they were losing. Mm. It was a very harsh battle. You were in a very remote environment. Mm. There was a lot of violence against the activists. There were lots of divisions. It, it was, it was, it, you could see, you know, with all the money and the resources that the logging industry had, mm. that these activists were going to lose. Mm. So we thought, okay, we're losing on the ground. So what do we do? And then we sort of realized, where's all this stuff going? Mm. And then we started looking at the international market. Mm. Mm. And then we found that these temperate rainforests were being chopped down. Mm turned into pulp and paper, and either used by the publishing industry, mm. or used you know, for tissue paper, toilet mm. paper, things mm. like that. Mm. Anyway, we then started investigating this and tracking where this was ending up. Mm. So we found that the BBC Wildlife magazine <laughs> yes. was being printed on Gosh. paper yes. that came from the temperate rainforest mm. that was threatening some quite iconic species like the white spirit there. And so, mm. Mm. so of course then, you know, we got Attenborough involved mm. of course, and the BBC yeah. cancelled the contract. Attenborough made some very powerful statements saying mm. this rainforest needs to be protected. The German publishing industry got involved as well. They were very powerful. Mm. So, so basically what happened is that the biggest buyers mm. of the products resulting from this destruction of the temperate rainforest all started cancelling contracts. Yes. And so this really was the start of what we now call sort of Greenpeace marketing campaign, right. market campaigning, which right. Right. you know has been made more famous yes. through cattle and so in the Amazon or pulp and paper palm oil in, in Indonesia yes. or, or elsewhere. But this was the first instance when we kind of used that power of being a global organization mm. and and tackling 
these uh, corporation supply chain mm. and holding the people to account who are buying this product mm. not just the people who are destroying the environment and and it worked very effectively but also you know this was a very long campaign mm. because mm. we they agreed eventually to a moratorium about 10 years ago mm. they stopped mm. and then it was in negotiations for 10 years mm. between the NGOs, including Greenpeace, First Nations, mm. and the British Columbia government. Mm. And then the agreement was signed, I think, earlier this year. Mm. We then had the stamp of approval from the Duke and Duchess of yes. Cambridge. Mm. So, you know, from 1995 yes, to today, yes. you know, this is uh, a long, well, 20, a 21 battle. years uh, to actually come to a good conclusion. But, you know, we were able to stay with it. Mm and we were able to see it to a successful end. Mm -hmm. So I think it is, in, in many ways, it is a, it is a great yes. uh, story. Yeah. And it was also the kind of forerunner of corporations beginning to take control over their supply chain yes. and, and beginning to put sustainability um, into their kind of procurement processes. Yes. So if you say, fast forward to 2008 mm. when we launched the campaign against Unilever because mm. of palm oil mm. and the destruction of Indonesia's rainforest mm. I remember who's now my very good friend Gavin Neath yes being interviewed on Sky News and the interviewer saying so do you know where your palm oil comes <laughs> from and Mr Neath said some of it but not all of it the Unilever um, CSR man at the, at the time at the time lead on that yes. yeah yeah and of course this was enormously embarrassing to Unilever because they yeah. were trumpeting themselves as this mm. great environmentally friendly mm. company mm. very into sustainability mm. but if you looked at the biggest impact that they were having on the planet I mean they brought mm. one percent of the global mm. supply of palm oil the biggest buyer of palm oil mm. was the destruction of Indonesia's rainforest mm. with huge uh, climate and mm. biodiversity implications, they hardly had a clue where it was coming from. Where yeah. it was coming from, they knew very little about their supply chain. Now, if you mm. fast forward five years or more, they now know everything, and they're among the leaders, thanks to Paul Pullman of, of the yeah. corporate leadership on the yeah. environment. But and that's been but yes, it was that's also been quite a long way. journey. Yes. Quite a yeah. difficult journey, mm. and of course, then joined by Nestle and mm. Procter and Gamble and Kraft and everybody else. But, but, and still loads of unresolved issues mm. today. Sure. Uh, but, but we are in a very different place mm. in in 2016 compared to where we were in 2008, mm. and or even compared to where we were in in 1995 mm. when we we launched the the international phase of the Great Bear Rainforest campaign. So, it's been a long yeah, journey, it's a long journey yeah. but. I have seen immense changes, um, positive changes in that time. And we need many more CEOs to, to think about the issues as seriously as people like Paul Pullman are. And, and well, are yes. Mm. The, the, I, I think there are a lot of corporations doing things. Mm. And, and I mean, even, you know, if you take, say, um, um, the Amazon, where we, we launched a campaign to stop soya. Yes. Yeah. As, a, as a driver of the Amazon rainforest and we targeted McDonald's mm -hmm. you know because McDonald's were buying um, chicken McNuggets from Cargill mm -hmm. and the chickens were being fed on soya from the Amazon mm -hmm. now uh, you know McDonald's did change very fast mm -hmm. and they were also very angry because mm -hmm. they didn't know mm -hmm. that their soya for their chickens came from the yeah. destruction right. of the Amazon rainforest because Cargill never told them mm -hmm. but you see again it, it, it was a question of in those days, mm. and that's only a few years ago, mm. corporations didn't ask these questions. Mm. They didn't find these things out. Mm. Mm. They knew very little about their supply chain. Mm. And I suppose today that that's changed. Right. Now they yeah. know a lot more. And also yeah. technology has yeah. enabled them to find out a lot more. Mm. In fact, Nestle told me when I last met them in, in, in Geneva that they have mm. something like two million suppliers mm. down to the farm mm. and they map the lot. Mm. Mm. Now whether they're all sustainable or not is another matter. Mm. But the thing is, these companies did put an enormous investment into finding out what was happening in the supply chain. Yes. And I suppose you, you found similar things happening in, in, in say, closing you know where you had all this issue about child labor mm. you had all those factories in Bangladesh horrendous treatment of workers mm. people mm. dying in fires because of lack of health and safety and mm. so on 
this was coming back to really harm some major high street brands mm. and so they were also forced to act in other areas mm. as well mm. you know mm. have we made enough progress obviously not but are we making some progress or yeah. not yeah thank you i wanted to ask you two more questions if i may one about the politics of all of this and how to win the argument for better action on the environment and how to do so in a non-partisan way um, uh, so a, a question on that, if I may, and then I wanted to ask you more of a sort of moral, philosophical question about hope and about mm. optimism and how you you keep going in all this because mm. you've done so much, and I feel like you, you, you. Well, I certainly feel like you know we, we we win many battles, but then we lose others, and we keep going. And I wanted to sort of get a sense about mm. you know, what gives you hope for the yeah, future. In a okay. sense. <laughs> so could I ask you both of those questions and uh, yeah. about the politics and how yeah. to avoid effectively the environment becoming a, a partisan issue and how to transcend sort of politics yeah. to the extent possible to, to bring everybody on board yeah. on what we're trying to do. I mean, look, I think, I mean, partly I think we have to take some blame for this ourselves mm. in, in, in the fact that when you look at, say, environment, environment tends to be a silo. So mm. you, in government you have lots of departments mm. and one is labelled environment and normally environment gets kicked first when it comes to any budgetary cuts or something mm. like that. Normally it's a minister that isn't taken very seriously mm. and the government doesn't give very much time or space mm. for it. Now, when I kind of think about that, I think that, you know, this is a, this is sort of a rather crazy way of looking at the world. Mm. Mm. And I suppose many people have said, you know, first comes planet Earth yes. and the economy is a kind of subset. Whereas in fact, the way we look at it is the economy comes first. <laughs> And planet Earth is a kind of subset of yeah. the economy, but that's not that's not a very rational mm. thing to do because you know you've only got one home. Mm. Um, so if you destroy your home, you're going to be in trouble. Mm. So I suppose, in a way, really, what should have happened is mm. that the environment should be in every department, mm. and it should mm. not be in a department on its own, mm. Mm. and that you know sustainability should be at the heart of everything that a government does. Mm. It shouldn't be. Uh, put into a, a little box or a mm. unit somewhere, and I suppose we saw the same thing with, um, you know, with 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 companies. You know, as you say, mm. we had these CSR people, you know, to mm. corporate sustainability. Mm. They weren't taken very seriously. Mm. They were put out on a wing of a company somewhere, mm. and and this was an enormous mistake mm. because ultimately mm. this is yeah. what this was the biggest risk that the companies faced. Mm -hmm. This is actually what came back to bite them, mm. and them not dealing with it meant that. They were they were paying a price mm. uh, for not dealing with it, mm. and they were threatening the future of their ability to be able to operate as a company going forward. You mm. know, which is something that Paul Palman mm. at Unilever talks about mm. a lot in a in a in a climate changing world mm. uh, yes. with refugees and war and conflict and drought and so on and so forth. It is very difficult to conduct business. Yes. Um, so, so the thing is, is that if you take care of these things, mm. you're going to create a more stable environment where businesses mm. are more likely to to thrive, and people are more likely to be um, healthy and have better well-being and so mm. on. And I, and I think it's also, you know, a, a, an issue. It's a bit like we were discussing the link between environment and health. Yes. Or you know, the, the, between you know both physical health and, and and mental health, is is that you know our um, alienation from the environment, our disconnect mm. from the environment, mm. is, is, is one leading to much more health issues mm. um, and also is, is leading to a very unsustainable future. Mm. Mm. So if you had environment and health linked and then now you look at energy, well energy you need for climate change, so you, li you link energy together. So you know, if, you was, if you were now looking at it mm. in a different way, you would have a department for environment, health and energy mm. yes. or, or whatever. Yeah. You know, it, you would look at it in a things. yeah. You would look mm. at it in a in a in a very different way to the way mm. um, we look at it. Mm. And then somebody, some comedian said, you know, about uh, the environment has dropped down the agenda, and he said it's a bit like breathing has dropped down the agenda. <laughs> you know, yes. we need to breathe. You yeah. can't say yeah. breathing isn't important. Like yeah. the environment isn't important. Yeah. You know, the two are closely connected. We need yeah. clean air. We yeah. need clean water. We need a healthy environment in order to survive. Yeah. 
So when you say it's dropped down the agenda, mm. it doesn't make sense. Mm. Mm. Um, of course. A, and so I, I kind of think that that's our fault in a way mm. um, by not really making mm. those kinds of um, connections. Mm. And, you know, we've kind of, oh, well, they've created a little department for us, so we'll go and interact mm. with that little department. Whereas, in fact, actually what we should have been doing is looking at it in a, in a much more mm. kind of holistic way in the way we interacted. We're better at doing that now, and people right. understand it better now, yeah. but we're nowhere near there at the moment. Yeah. And politicians of the left and right need to own the environmental agenda equally. It, it mustn't become an agenda which is somehow owned by the left or mm. characterised by the left. Like yeah, but, the, you know, I don't mm. think it is. No. I mean, people mm. say, oh, the environment is a left-wing issue mm. and there's the environmental organisations are left-wing mm. organisations. Mm. Um, but actually, I don't think mm. really that's true. Uh, actually, if you, if, you, if you look at the left, they've been a disaster for the environment. Mm. Mm. Um, and I think they've been just as much a disaster <laughs> as the right have, frankly. Sure. Mm. I mean, I don't think anybody yeah. has really looked at the environment and thought I'm going to put this at the center of my vision mm, mm. and everything is going to flow from that mm. so I'm going to have sustainable energy mm. I'm going to have sustainable housing mm. I'm going to have sustainable food I'm going to have a healthy population I mean if, if you wanted to you could put your vision mm. around that mm, mm. and it would be a very powerful vision mm. and I think a lot of people would buy into it mm. but neither of the major political mm. parties do that mm. And a question then about the, the sort of the hope and the optimism and, and, and what keeps you going. What's your sort of philosophy? What what gets you out of bed in the morning? How, how does John Savin keep going in his <laughs> heroic efforts? Well, you know, I mean, the thing is, is it, I mean, it's very interesting this in a, in a way, because if you look at some to some of our, our scientists, say like Stephen Hawking or Martin mm. Rees or e even um, um, James Lovelock, I've mm. recently been talking about the fact that that the human species is finished mm. and that we actually need now to go into space to mm. find more planets in yes. order to survive because we will not be able to survive on planet Earth. I mean, this is a particularly kind of depressing picture, mm. Mm. but then they also talk about the evolution of the human species, you know, from carbon Mm. Um, to a kind of more mm. <laughs> synthetic <laughs> kind of species into robots, cyborgs, all the rest of it. Um, but I, but I kind of think, you know, okay, that's one way where you could say the future lies. Mm. Yeah. And I think another way is, is you know, is, is a sort of uh, uh, more in terms of, say, what Prince Charles has been doing mm. with Harmony, mm. is saying actually what we need to do is understand better our place within the environment, mm, mm. find a new way of living with our fellow species mm, mm. within a natural env mm. environment, which will give us health mm. and employment mm. and well-being mm. and so on and so forth. And I suppose it's a, it's a kind of, you know, from, from my point of view, that's a, probably a more kind of a realistic but difficult mm. scenario to mm. achieve mm. but one I think that's worth fighting mm. for mm. and I and I suppose also if you um, l coming back to what I said at the beginning about um, there are two big issues we mm. face climate change and biodiversity mm. loss there are only two things that we need to do mm. one is um, look at the issue of fossil fuels and look at the issue of meat consumption mm. both of them are easily doable mm, mm. with the technology and the resources that we have available mm. um, today mm. and, and when it comes to, to, to energy renewables are pretty much now cost competitive with fossil fuels. Mm. So I kind of feel today we're on the cusp of something mm. in terms of it being possible whereas if you say went back five or ten years mm. people could rightly argue renewables are very expensive. Mm -hmm. People are going to have to you know, standard of living is going to have to suffer, they're going to have to pay far more for their energy bills mm. and so on and so forth. Today that's not, mm. that's actually not true today. Mm. And, but it is a, you know, this is all about power and politics. Mm. Where your resources go, what you spend your money on. Mm -hmm. We spend trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars fighting wars in the Middle East. Mm. Mm. That could pretty much solve all the world's problems mm. if we rethought that alone. And we also spend trillions on fossil fuel subsidies for the existing... Trillions on fossil fuel subsidies. Yeah. Trillions yeah. on, 
you know, all this quantitative easing and so on, mm. um, which just inflates share prices. It mm. could be going into, you know, uh, green bonds uh, investment while interest rates are almost mm. zero, you know, investment in, in low carbon mm. infrastructure and so on and so forth. You know, immense possibilities we mm. have here to mm. solve these problems. Mm. I, that, I suppose, if anything, that's my frustration. I mm. see the solutions are not that difficult. Mm. Mm. We could solve these problems. Mm. Mm. Um, but but the politics stops us, and that's where I really think we have to change. We've really got to challenge the governments far more powerfully than we've mm. done, and you know where Greenpeace's expertise lies and where we put most of our effort is is challenging corporations because mm. ultimately they're a very powerful force, mm. more powerful than most governments today. Mm. Frankly, mm. Mm. very very clear. Are you optimistic that we can do it? Uh, well, I can see how we can do it mm. quite easily mm. so <laughs> i would say it was more glass uh, half full than glass half empty mm. but you know without doubt we see horrendous loss of biodiversity and increasing mm. impacts of climate change mm. and mm. that that is uh, that is depressing but there are yeah. lots of green shoots lots of good news stories out there as well yeah. the challenge is to Act now with renewed determination to put things on a better track in, yeah. the, in the very short term, and to harness our collective energy and intellect and will to, to make to make that happen. Agree, agree. Well, John, thank you very much. Pleasure. Oh, lovely to talk to you. <laughs> and thank you for agreeing to the interview. Okay. And um, good. Very grateful. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. <laughs> Cheers, Cheers, John. <laughs> Thanks very much. All right. I'm very grateful. Um, I hope that was all right from your side. Yeah, it was fine. Okay. In fact, actually, you might as well take that tape because we would. It was an hour. Was it an hour? Okay. Which is fine, okay. and I, you don't need to edit it. That's so kind of you. Well, you you are a one take one. And um, I'll. Um, all right, and yes, you can write to Nicole. I thought she was just. Um, yes, she might still be in the building. Did you know she was coming here? Uh, no, I didn't. No, we just met in the hallway. Um, oh, you, oh, by by yeah, by complete chance. Oh, really? <laughs> and actually, I said to her, that, you know, she should come in. We'd love to talk to her about you know, yeah. what, what she's doing, because I'm so pleased that William and Kate went last week. So good. So good. Marge, we did a one, we did a one take wonder. We did. Yeah. Marge, it doesn't need editing. <laughs> it was a heck of a long, did he draw breath? <laughs> no. He was brilliant. <laughs>